I, I didn't mean to stress you out so much by, <laughs> by this uh, just-in-time stuff, but um, uh, for those who know me, this is the only way I can do things. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about the energy challenges and opportunities. I want to stress that although there are severe challenges, there are incredible opportunities, especially um, in this transition to a sustainable world, there are economic opportunities that the United States has that I feel very strongly we should not uh, overlook. So the outline of the talk is uh, very simple. Um, I'm going to just briefly remind you of one or two innovations that truly transformed the world. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, some are more free than others, but virtually nothing is really free. And uh, then go into how I think innovations can really um, move things along. But this is not only technical innovations, but policies are also needed, as you heard uh, from Senator Bingaman. And in the question and answer period, I certainly talk about those things. All right, so let me talk about innovations. Well, the invention of the improved steam engine by James Watt, he actually didn't invent the steam engine, he just made it more practical, it really transformed the world where you go to horses, from horses to iron horses. One of my favorite paintings is this one by Turner, where the Tamar, which is an iconic sailing ship, Tamari, Tamari, uh, being towed for scrap by a steam-powered tugboat. Uh, so this is being going to be broken up for scrap, uh, the setting of a, an age of sailing uh, ships and um, and powered ships are now taking over. So the trains and powered ships followed by airplanes really transformed how we move people, how we move goods around the world. Another, uh, another really important thing was the automobile. Uh, again, Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile or the internal combustion engine. He didn't even invent the assembly line. He improved it. And it, with the improved assembly line, he started really a revolution in personal transportation. It was not obvious at the beginning that this revolution was going to occur. Um, it's not obvious that all companies that start in any new revolution that does become successful is successful. So I should point out that Henry Ford started two earlier companies. Uh, one failed, the one in 1899. In uh, 1901, it didn't fail. Um, Henry Ford was a bit of a control freak, and he did not like the idea of another engineer at a motor company. So when they hired a second engineer, he quit and <laughs> founded uh, a third company. Um, luckily for him, the second company was named Ford Motor Company, but they said, you can keep that name. And they changed the name, I think, to a Cadillac. <laughs> um, anyway. So while Ford was running around trying to raise money for this third company, uh, his lawyer asks the president of Michigan Savings Bank, uh, should I invest in this company? And he says, no, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. Uh, the lawyer did not listen to the president of the bank, invested $5,000, and sold it for $12 million. But this was in the... 1900s, early 1900s, so just move the decimal point over by about one, and you can get an idea. Now, let me also remind you that it's not only uh, this banker that was, didn't think the automobile was here to stay. It was reported gasolines exploded inside the cylinder of an engine. The dangers are obvious. Stores of gasoline in the hands of people interested primarily in profit would constitute a fire and explosive hazard of the first rank goes on to say, you know, these things could go 15, 20 miles an hour. They would be a menace to our roads. The cost of producing gasoline is far beyond the financial capacity of private industry. In addition, development of this new power may displace the use of horses, which would wreck our agriculture. So uh, congressional record. So some things don't change. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there were, there were embedded, in, no, to be really serious, there are embedded interests uh, in existing technology, and those people, and if they see a new technology that might be threatening, if it's not threatening, they don't care. But if it might be threatening, uh, they bring out all, all the powers that they can muster to try to slow it down or stop it. And so this is an example of uh, existing technology, namely um, 
uh, the transition from horses to automobiles. Uh, even an existing technology, when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, uh, he thought it was a great invention, gets a patent, he goes to the British Post Office, he goes to Western Union and wants to partner with these people. British Post, the head, chief technology officer of the British Post Office said, well, Americans may have use for this telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, let's talk about the transition of the automobile. If you think about it, it required incredible infrastructure change, and it required better roads, it required, required uh, uh, infrastructure for fueling the, the automobiles, uh, it required many things, but yet, if you look at the streets in major cities on uh, the turn of the last of the 19th century, uh, what you find is, for example, in New York, you find mostly horse-drawn carriages, but by the 1920s, uh, you have the streets dominated by automobiles. Um, it turned out to be a superior technology for a number of reasons, uh, but there was one thing that uh, hastened the transition, and that was there was an environmental problem. So what was the environmental problem? Well, yes, someone got it here in the first uh, table. Uh, I prefer to say it was horse manure. Uh, 160,000 horses in Manhattan and Brooklyn producing three to four million pounds of manure a day. That's a lot. Uh, all the vacant lots in New York City were piled up uh, sometimes as high as one story. Uh, it was littering the streets, young, uh, Kids would um, offer services. They would brush the streets by uh, for well-to-do pedestrians so they can walk across the street and only get the moon on the bottom of their shoes instead of being ankle deep. Uh, the fertilizer market was saturated. Um, <laughs> and so it was the horse manure that was really uh, driving a lot of this, especially in cities. So. Um, Let's talk about there's no such thing as a free lunch. There is an equivalent environmental impact with um, the Industrial Revolution, and that's uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, this is to remind you that over from 1800 to 2010, the average land temperature of the Earth has been increasing. Now, I want to draw your attention to a few things. Much has been said, especially in Washington, D.C., over the last uh, eight or nine years that there's no temperature increase that's plateaued. It's not changing at all, which is true, sort of, right? It's plateaued. Uh, we don't understand this plateau. We don't understand this plateau. We don't understand how, why the temperature is going down in certain parts. Uh, so in terms of climate models, the climate models are so far unable to predict, even over the global average, a dip like this. They're unable to predict a plateau like this, but when you start to average over 50 or 100 years or 200 years, it gets a little easier. And it gets a little easier because uh, the slight changes in the reflectance of the Earth due to sulfur dioxide, the ocean currents, all these things begin to go away. <coughs> as long as the energy coming onto the Earth is the same uh, and the energy going out is less, then you have a conservation of energy issue. And so on, over a longer period of time, uh, that is what's happening. But let me focus a little bit about the last 35 years, the uh, last 32 years. Uh, this is where 75% of the temperature increases uh, started. And so let's not, I'm not gonna dwell on climate models, I'm gonna dwell on some evidence. Uh, the sea level is rising and um, it's rising due to the fact that as the oceans get warmer, the sea literally expands. But it's also rising because there's melt-off on ice on land. There was a big debate as to whether Greenland was indeed losing its ice uh, cap, or at least shrinking, because there was increased snow in Greenland. So there might be more glacial runoff, but maybe it's increasing, or maybe it's decreasing. And so uh, over the last, um, 12 years, 13 years, there have been some satellites that have been circling the Earth. These, this is a cartoon. This is, these are what the satellites look like, but it's, but they're not, they don't, they're not that big. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, what they are are little satellites that circle around the Earth, and the distance between them is monitored very closely. 
So if there's a gravitational anomaly, a little unevenness in the gravitational field, it perturbs the satellite orbits ever so slightly. So the distance between them changes. And by monitoring the change in the orbit, just Newtonian mechanics, you can back calculate what the change of the local gravity is on Earth. And uh, what they find is that over Greenland, the ice mass has been indeed decreasing from, this is a record from 2002 to 2009, it's decreasing, it's decreased, it's accelerating. The sensitivity is good enough to see summer, winter, summer, winter, which are those oscillations. Now, there's a GRACE-2 project that's uh, ready for launch. Um, some of the climate skeptics don't really want it launched, and they're fighting very hard. Uh, they're, because there's an old adage, if you can't see what's happening, it's not happening. But in any case, um, and then there are newer technologies that can perhaps increase the sensitivity maybe 100-fold. 100-fold will mean that you can get a good look at the Himalayan plateau. You can go look at regions in Antarctica, other things, just to monitor what's happening. Now, I'll tell you a few one-offs. There's a, and uh, some of you may remember there was a heat wave in Europe in 2003. Most of you will not know that 52,000 people died in that heat wave, uh, partly because Italy uh, took about a, almost a decade to actually admit that 18,000 people died in Italy. There was no air conditioning. They weren't used to hot temperatures, and 52,000 people died. In Moscow in 2010, 10,000 to 15,000 deaths reported uh, in a heat wave there. Um, Chicago heat wave, over 700 people died. But in these other heat waves, tens of thousands of people. But you know, people say, and I agree with this, that just one heat wave or a couple heat waves doesn't really tell the story at all, and I agree with that. So let's look at a record that goes back more than 30 years. This is a record actually taken by a reinsurance company called Munich Re. A reinsurance company are companies that insure other companies, because if there's a big natural disaster, a storm, a hurricane, an earthquake, uh, the insurance company might not have the wherewithal to pay off the premiums, so they, in fact, take out insurance. So the uh, ins reinsurance companies are very concerned about big events that cause financial losses. And so in this instance, they have divided up the financial losses. This is the brown down here are geological events. These are earthquakes. There are storms in dark green. There are floods in blue. There are what they call climatological events, extreme temperature droughts, forest fires, and orange. These are the number of events in the United States over the last 32 years. So the number of events in the United States where it's, there's pretty good reporting, uh, it just increased. And, and these, are, these, are not, these are storms. These are not rains and drizzles. These are the things that, cause, uh, that reach a threshold that might cause insurance losses. So that's the number of events in the United States. This is the uh, losses, the financial losses in the United States. Uh, the dark peel, teal is uh, insured losses. The lighter color is uninsured losses. And the trend line for total losses starts in 1980 at about $40 billion a year. And it's about the trend line, again, that dotted line, is about $170 billion a year of losses. Now, most of the law insurance losses in the world are in the United States because we're the richest company in the world. Uh, but again, most of it is uninsured losses. Now, these uninsured losses are actually are underestimated. And I'll, give, I'll tell you an example why I think they're underestimated. Uh, let me take flood insurance. So in the blue are what the companies were taking in in premiums. And in the orange, that's what they were giving out in premiums. So it looks pretty good. They're making a profit. They're taking more in premiums than they're paying out. And then a singular event happens. And all of a sudden, oops, uh, there's a lot more payout, which is why you want reinsurance companies. But uh, in this case, it was a big event. Uh, that was Katrina. And what did that do? So let's plot it differently. Uh, this is uh, data from FEMA, and when you see positive numbers, this is in billions of dollars, two, four, six, eight, ten billion dollars, you means the insurance companies are in the hole, and then they recover, and then they're in the hole again, and then they recover, and oops, they can't recover. 
Why can't they recover? The interest on $18 billion is too high. And even when the interest was at 2%, it's too high. And when the interest goes up to a more normal, and so this is before Isaac and Sandy, okay? So who's paying for this? Are the insurance companies going bankrupt? Nope. The US government backstops flood insurance. So you are, and I am. And so whether it's 18 billion or 20 billion or 30 billion, or somewhere between 20 and 30 billion dollars per year in interest, it's being paid for by your taxpayer dollars. This is not included in reinsurance losses because insurance companies don't care about it when government pays for it. Not really, okay? So the losses due to extreme events is actually considerably larger. One of the things I'd love to do at Stanford is have a, a graduate student or postdoc or two and actually peel back what are the real numbers of these losses. Uh, because I think it would add a little bit more uh, understanding to what are the costs of changes in climate events. Uh, now, this is a prediction, and so take it with a lot of grain of salt, but, uh, because it has to do with climate modeling. But, but in this prediction, if we are going in the direction we're heading within the later part of this century, uh, you see these danger areas, which you see in red, anything in the darker colors, orange and red, are very high probabilities uh, that this land will become a desert. Uh, see, the gray doesn't show up because it's already a desert, that's the Sahara. But certainly over the last two decades, this desert line between the Sahara and Sub-Saharan Africa is marching down steadily. Uh, in the United States, it's a little bit different. Things west of the Mississippi are pretty tenuous, and for those living in California, you know, you know, you kind of pray for rain, even in June. Um, and, and so uh, one is, is very worried about the, the water supplies. Uh, if you live anywhere in the western states, you're worried about water supplies. If you're living in the Midwest and you're doing agriculture, you see a steadily dropping water table. In fact, the water table uh, is so severe that Texas, of all states, has now passed a law that limits the amount of water their farmers can take out of the water tables. This is Texas, because it's been dropping so dramatically. So in any case, uh, these things are changing. All right, so then the question is, uh, suppose you believe in renewable energies and say, hey Steve, not to worry, uh, the price of oil and gas are going to go up and up, and, and uh, we're going to have to go to renewables anyway. But let me quote one of my two favorite authors, two of my favorite authors. Our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve, and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with the rising demand for decades. That was said by me in a room of Jamdar. <laughs> in a, and a nature paper that reviewed what are the, some of the technical things that could be happening in energy. It's, and uh, at the near the end of the paper, we reminded readers of a well-known expression, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. What is unsaid is you transition to better solutions. So the issue is, can you transition to better solutions? Better solutions mean cleaner solutions, but economically viable solutions as cheap as fossil fuel? And that's the question. So this goes back to the science and technology, and I want to talk about just very briefly two things, energy efficiency and clean energy sources. And so, and these are some of the innovations we will need. So let me first talk about energy efficiency. Uh, we'll start with the refrigerator. This is a uh, a converted ice box. It's a refrigerator in the 1940s. This cooling coil up on the top replaced the hunk of ice. And, but as refrigerators got bigger, as innovations like frost-free refrigerators came into being, frost-free freezers, uh, the energy consumption started increasing dramatically. For those of you who don't know, a frost-free freezer works in the following way. You blow hot air into the freezer and you it's, and you uh, melt the thin veneer of ice that's forming on your food or on your wrappers of your food. And then after you've melted it, you collect the water and then you recool it. So you might think, gee, that's not very efficient. And you're right. However, it is a huge convenience because I remember when I was a kid in the 50s, 
Uh, I had to chip away at this little ice box that had the little freezer inside, and you'd have to boil up these tea kettles. You have to open the thing. You have to unload the entire refrigerator, put top boiling water inside. You chip it away with a butter knife. And it was not, I did this once, you know, in the summer, it was like, in Long Island, it was like once a month. Uh, because, not because I was a good kid uh, and wanted to help my parents, it's because the ice got so thick that the freezer door wouldn't close and the ice cream wouldn't stay hard. <laughs> so in any case, uh, it was a big deal. Uh, and so of course people wanted frost free. Then it started in 1975, California passed a minimum refrigerator standard. If you want to sell a refrigerator in California, it has to use no more than X amount of energy per unit size. And of course, the refrigerator's efficiencies increased. So much so that compared to 1975 refrigerators, today's refrigerators are about 22% bigger, but they cost three times less to own than the refrigerators of 1975. Today's refrigerators use much less energy than this one, even despite the frost free, even despite the fact they were two and a half times bigger. They use less energy than the 1940s and 50s refrigerators. Better insulation, better compressors, better things. Okay. Then you say, well, this, of course, no, there's no free lunch. It comes with a cost. Yes, you have more efficient refrigerators, maybe over a 20-year period of the life of the refrigerator, because of the electricity bill, you're saving money, but many people are worried about the purchase price, and, and the purchase price might dominate. So I did something when I was in the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, we uh, set appliance standards regulations, and it's something very unusual uh, for uh, people in the social sciences, less unusual than people in the sciences. What does the data say? <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, was uh, some work done by Robert Van Busterick and I with Kathleen Cantor and others. Uh, it turns out that all these people used to be their uh, former physicists, uh, but now working in energy efficiency. So what is the blue are the life cycle costs. That's the purchase price and the cost of energy in the United States. And you have to average where the refrigerators are and uh, how much the actual electricity costs. Uh, the, and the open data, the open units are before standards, and after there's a series of three California standards, three federal standards, this is the life cycle cost. You notice, this is what's called a, a learning curve. When you double the number of units shipped, let's say 50 to 100, then this is a, this is a, a price doubling, 6,000, 12,000, 3,000, 1,500. And so what this means is that the cost equals the number shipped to some power. And so on a log log curve, it shows up as a straight line. And um, so you can, if you take this trend line, you can say, well, if we didn't have snares, maybe the life cycle cost would be here about $4,000, but it's not. It's about $1,400. What about the purchase price? This is the purchase price in red. Wait a minute. It didn't go up. In fact, you can maybe argue it might have gone down a little bit. Well, how could that be? Isn't that a market failure? Because certainly manufacturers want to make the same product cheaper and cheaper for com competitive sake. And so maybe so, maybe not, but I'm an experimental physicist, not a theorist. I'm uh, willing to theorize. Could be a market failure of sorts because if you're forced to make a new product, you might retool. And when you retool, you might be more efficient in production, sort of like what Japanese and Korean steel did, where we didn't retool the United States. And even though we have the iron ore and the coal that we ship to China and Japan and Korea to make steel, and we buy their steel, we have all the raw ingredients. OK, they retooled. Clothes washers, same thing occurs. Life cycle costage goes down dramatically. Oops, now it's even more apparent. In clothes washers, the life cycle, the purchase price went down. It didn't even stay the same. It went down. Room air conditioning is the same. Central air conditioning is the same. So we looked at four appliances in the United States over a 50-year period, 30-year period. We looked at the same appliances in Europe, say similar trends. The purchase price was going down at the same trend at worst, but sometimes it accelerated. 
Okay. Uh, we submitted this paper to science, and uh, we got three reviews, one glowing review. This is amazing. Most of it was how we got the data. This is what we did. Huge supplementary material things and how we treated the data, all this stuff, uh, because that's the most important. The other two reviewers, I will paraphrase by saying, it doesn't matter what you say, the economists are not going to believe this. <laughs> Why aren't they going to believe the data? Well, it's because uh, they said, you haven't explained the market failure. Okay. All right. So, efficiency. Appliance standards are a very big deal. Uh, we're trying to raise very much more aggressively appliance standards. I wanted to double the rate of doing this when I was secretary, and then I wanted to double it again. The president gave us, in his climate change speech, uh, it, uh, said this was a very good thing. Um, uh, but uh, the o OMB is actually dragging their feet on this. When Cass Sunstein was there, he was a great ally, but when he left, they, uh, this is, but never mind. It's really important. It saves money, period. Okay? It just plain saves money, as well as energy. Uh, airplanes have become incredibly efficient. Uh, the 787 uses 30% of the fuel as the 707, the really first commercially successful airplane. 30%. Uh, it's improved aerodynamics, better materials, better engines, better everything. Um, new materials can make a profound impact on anything having to do with energy and industrial production in general. Let me give you an example. The Washington Monument is capped with a precious metal. What is that metal? It looks silvery on the top. So you think maybe silver is the silver plate, well, not silver tarnishes, maybe platinum. Nope, aluminum. Aluminum. For the father of our country, isn't that being a little cheap? Uh, okay, not really. And when the Washington Monument was uh, completed in 1884, the price of aluminum was a dollar an ounce. The price of gold was $20 an ounce. The highest paid craftsman working on the Washington Monument was $2 a day. So it was a precious metal. Uh, now, nowadays, aluminum's six cents an ounce. Gold's, eh, it used to be 776 an ounce, but uh, it's now fifteen hundred dollars instead of uh, one thousand seven hundred. But but this is what's the difference? Why why is aluminum plunged in price? It's because we figured out a better way to refine aluminum to high purity. You put a molten ore in a chloride bath, you put a big electrical current through it, and very pure aluminum comes out. Uh, both DARPA and uh, energy department are trying to do this with titanium. Titanium is actually a very abundant material. Titanium dioxide can be found in many, many places. But for aircraft grade titanium, you have to heat it and refine it three times, going to reddish white hot temperatures uh, in order to do this. So the energy in order to get really pure, strong titanium is enormous. Therefore, the cost is enormous. And so the question is, can you make an electrolytic process to refine titanium in one fell swoop the way we do with aluminum. And if you can, uh, the energy consumption goes down ninefold. The price might go down fivefold, because it's mostly energy in this production. So that's one of the other things I think uh, that would be very useful. Now, another thing in energy efficiency uh, and offsetting energy would be uh, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids or purely electric vehicles. Now, in the Department of Energy, we had a goal uh, within 10 years, and by 2022, could you produce a car, something on the order of $25,000 without subsidy, that could be competitive with a car that's about $22,000, an internal combustion car without subsidy? If you can do that, or $20,000, you can have a car that would have a payback period of five years or less just in fuel, based on today's gasoline prices and, and today's electricity prices. So we call this EV everywhere. Uh, the president announced it, which we were very happy with. And so this requires a number of things. The most important thing is it requires a battery that has to have several qualities. Uh, the cost of the battery has to decrease by a lot. It has to have an increase in energy density. Uh, it has to have durability to last 15 years. Uh, with high probability, and it has to be uh, temperature tolerant so that you can park it in a Phoenix outside garage for a week and you will still have a battery when you come back. Uh, 
And so these are some of the things uh, that are very important in the batteries. Uh, in 2008, the cost of manufacturing batteries for the Chevy Volt uh, and Nissan Leaf type batteries was $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Um, we had a goal 2022 of um, $125 a kilowatt hour, which sounds like that's, you're crazy, you're on something, but not really. Uh, by 2012, the cost of manufacturing the batteries are $500 a kilowatt hour, uh, except Tesla claims their cost of manufacturing is about $300 a kilowatt hour. But somewhere between three and $500 a kilowatt hour. The price dropped in half. Everybody expects the price will drop in half again in the next five or six years. Whether it drops fourfold, we don't know. But three or fourfold and magical things will happen if you have all these other qualities you know, 15-year lifetime uh, and better temperature range. Um, so this is a, a picture of how the battery energy density is increasing. The Chevy Volt, the Teslas are down here at 200 um, watt hours per kilogram. The new batteries being now being tested for, you know, nail tests and temperature things and all these other things are three or four hundred dollars uh, per uh, per uh, sorry, three, three or four watt hours per kilogram, and there are others being looked at in the laboratory scale that uh, double that again. Um, even at 400 uh, watt hours per kilogram, you're, you're half the size of today's batteries, and uh, in a car that's designed from the ground up, like the Tesla S, uh, where you have a platform and you can put the battery all over the bottom of the car, it doesn't really take up much energy. For those of you who peeked into a Tesla S, it's got a front trunk, it's got a back trunk, the total trunk space is at least comparable to a normal car. It, but if you, like the Chevy Volt, design it with a chassis that was designed for an internal combustion engine car and a transmission, you have a different story. And that's why you see a difference. The Nissan Leaf and the Tesla S were designed from the ground up. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, no, I won't skip this. There's another thing about batteries. The automobile batteries, like the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, Tesla S, only use about half the storage capacity of the battery for very conservative reasons. Um, it turns out that if you use only half of it, so you don't charge it all the way up to the top, you charge maybe 95%, you never discharge it to five or 10%, you only discharge it, in the case of the Chevy Volt, to 50% because the battery will last long. I mean, you have either in the, you know, a 10-year warranty or a lifetime guarantee warranty for original owner. And so they only use that. But if you could have battery in situ monitoring systems, you could actually use much more of the battery. And so one of the things that in RPE is we were looking for systems that could actually tell what's happening not in the outside of the battery, not in the outside of the battery pack, but actually what's happening in the battery itself, uh, you can actually use much more of the capacity uh, and use it much more safely. And so there are a bunch of innovative ways that I can't, don't have time to go into where this will, uh, this is occurring, very inexpensive ways of monitoring what's happening. Let me talk about clean energy sources. Now I've heard some people say, yeah, renewables are good in principle, but they're never going to supply the world with all the energy we need. It, there's just not enough solar power. There's not enough wind power. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. This is the amount of solar energy hitting the outside of the Earth. Uh, this is 174 petawatts. That's 10 to the 12 watts. And some of it gets reflected by the atmosphere. Some of it gets reflected by clouds. Some of it gets reflected by the Earth's surface or the oceans. Um, and how much does it get absorbed? Maybe 89 trillion, uh, million, million, a petawatt is a million, million uh, watts. Okay, the world energy consumption currently is about 150 petawatt hours per year. And so the amount, uh, that's 0.02% uh, uh, of the sun's energy absorbed by the Earth are being used for energy, okay, 0.02%. So not that much. So even if you go to just land-based collection, and while well, wind is uh, part of 
the solar energy also. Uh, you know, you can be pretty inefficient and you can get a major amount of energy from the sun. All right. So let's talk about wind. Uh, they're getting better because the towers are getting taller, the blades are getting better, the turbines are getting more reliable and better. Uh, they're getting pretty big. This is a 100 meter wind tower. This is one on the ocean. Um, the diameter of the blades is 93 meters, and the biggest ones are being sold at 126 meters. Let me give you how, what is 126 meters? Well, 100 meters is a soccer field, okay? But let me put it in terms of airplanes. The Airbus 380 has a wingspan of 80 meters. The Wright Brothers' first flight was 37 meters in total, okay? So, so we're talking um, one and a half Airbus 380 wingspan for these turbines. So they're getting pretty big, but they're getting more efficient. Um, electronics also very important. Uh, we started a program and asked the question, can you convert the transformers of today, and this is a sub-power station that weighs 70,000 pounds of taking high voltage DC and converting it to lower voltage, and can you make it smaller, more efficient, smarter, less costly? Can you make it 100 pounds? Uh, only if you go to higher frequencies. It turns out, not from basic physics, but more engineering, that if you go higher in frequency, instead of 60 hertz, you go to 60 kilohertz, the size of the transformer shrinks inversely with the frequency, all right, roughly speaking. and so. So you might think, is this a pipe dream? No, actually in the last RPE Summit, an uh, innovative company brought one of these things that was the equivalent uh, power of this, 70,000 pounds, but it fit in the back of a trunk in a suitcase that the person can lift and carry to the showcase, okay? The amazing thing about electronics is if Edison came back today, he would he'd look at a, an iPhone or an iPod and said, what's this? And what's this audio compression? What's that? Unrecognizable. But if he came back today, he would look at a transformer and say, oh, I know these. <laughs> they haven't changed in 100 years. Uh, but they're about to. And so uh, power conversion is going to change, and energy storage is going to change. Again, if we drop in price by factor of three, the utility companies will be putting energy storage at the ends of the distribution lines and the little utility boxes all around the country because they know the importance of distributed energy storage to balance their lines to make it more stable. Um, I just, as an aside, want to mention that power electronics, the conversion of AC to DC, going up in voltage, going down in voltage, all the little back boxes that power your computer and everything else, are called power electronics. We'll discount these utility scale electronics. But today, about 30% of electricity flows in power electronics. And in, by 2030, 80% will flow. Remarkably, most universities, engineering departments, no longer have professors in power electronics, uh, including Stanford and, and, uh, and MIT and many other major universities, and if you're out there in industry and you're in a startup company and need power electronics, you know you, it's very hard to get power electronics people. And so that's something I think the universities have to respond to. Let me talk briefly about solar energy. Again, the learning curve. You double, uh, this is now a factor of 10 up in production, another factor of 10 up in production. This is a factor of 10 down in price, another factor of 10 down in price. This is a learning curve for uh, polycrystalline silicon, and this is a learning curve for um, thin film, CAD telluride. Uh, this went off the learning curve in part because very generous feeding tariffs started in Germany, but with a ramp down, and so there was uh, an abundance of investment to uh, take advantage of this, and then in the last four or five years, there was an over-enthusiasm of investment, uh, particularly in China, uh, because of very inexpensive capital, and so there was an overproduction. And so the price was predicted, I think this was in 2008 or 9, to be here, something around 2015. The price is actually here. The spot market for solar modules uh, went from roughly $4 per watt. Uh, that means how much, 
how much does it cost under certain illumination for a module to generate one watt of electricity? And it has gone from four dollars a watt around 20, 2004 to 2013. It's about seventy cents. Okay, it really the bottom fell out uh, in part because of overproduction, in part because of a recession. Uh, things hopefully will stabilize for a little while, but they will continue to decline because the technology headroom is still very impressive. You can still make a lot of uh, savings. And so we looked at uh, what's the overall cost of installing, you know, complete installation, what's the overall cost? 2004, it was $8 a watt. Uh, and this, in this thing, you start to divide things in for the module itself is in this light green, and the balance of systems, the land use, the installation, the hookup, the permitting fees, all that other stuff is in orange, and there's a little sliver in blue that's, uh, I forget what this is. Um, um, but in any case, our prediction was by 2020, it would be 40 cents for the solar module. Well, it's 70 cents now. Um, they thought we were a little crazy when we said it can be, get down to 40 cents, but uh, the solar manufacturers now agree it can get to 40 cents by 2020. It turns out it's the balance of systems that's become the most expensive part of solar installation, especially on a rooftop, like on a home or a warehouse building. It's the installation, the licensing, and all those other costs. Okay, what? Now, among the solar modules themselves in silicon, it, this is how we make polycrystalline. You get some really pure silicon, and then you cast it in an ingot in this big furnace. And then after you've got this ingot, you saw them up into these bricks. And then you take a brick, a single brick, maybe this big on the side and that very long. And then you take a diamond string saw and slice it into very, very fine wafers, which then become your beginnings of your solar module. Half the material is lost, and it turns out you can't recycle this material. Uh, there's enough that's gone wrong when, by the time you do that, you just throw it away. Now, why am I telling you this? It's because half the cost of the silicon module is the cost of silicon. We, in the United States, are the biggest supplier of silicon in the world, including most of the Chinese solar modules, because our energy is so inexpensive, and because it's so energy intensive, we actually ship uh, PV grade silicon all over the world, okay? But it's half the cost. The module, the cost of silicon is half the cost. So if you can eliminate uh, this, it, these things are 100, this, these are 0.15 millimeters thick. And so you, it's hard to saw thinner than 0.51 millimeters and, and be able to handle it. Uh, and so that's nearing the limit. Maybe you can get to 0.1 millimeters if you're lucky. But you can actually, using light trapping techniques, go down to uh, one-fifth of what the current thickness is. You know, you can go 30 microns, maybe 40 microns. So um, we invested in research, uh, we invested some research dollars in a company called 1366 that uh, instead of being six grams a watt of silicon, can be three grams a watt by simply doing the following. Uh, this is their cartoon. This is a strawberry dipped in white chocolate. And so what they do is they take uh, a silicon substrate, they dip in molten silicon, and they let all the silicon dribble off. And then uh, they lift this uh, little thin sheet of silicon from this carbon substrate. Then you might think, oh, you're not going to make a very efficient solar cell that way because it's you know, got a lot of dislocations. It's, it's not very good. Uh, no, they're up to 16% of first conversion efficiency. 16. Okay? So, if this is, so they're scaling up to see if it gets to industrial strength. If they can keep 16, 17% and industrial strength, then it becomes very exciting because you've just cut the cost in half of the silicon, which means you've just reduced the price by 25%. All right, but what are the major costs? It's the cost of installation. Now, if you put some solar panels on a roof in Germany, it will cost you about $2.50 a watt. If you put them in Mexico, it costs $3.50. If you put them up in the United States, it costs $6 per watt. So how can it cost $2.50 in Germany and $6 in the United States? Well, it must be German labor is a lot cheaper. <laughs> 
anyway, uh, I'm being sarcastic, yes. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of red tape. There's a lot more uh, profitability in the way. So, it's, so instead of going for a large market share, they're going for make a, make a big amount of money on each little installation and the red tape. The red tape includes the application. Then you have to get an inspector to inspect your roof. Then you gotta get it after they've installed it. Another inspector to go out and inspect that it's been done right. Now consider what we do with hot water heaters, gas hot water heaters. In many cities, you don't have inspectors. Uh, sometimes the gas company comes by and, and looks for gas leaks, but aside from that, it's okay. It's between you and your plumber. If there's a leak, it's between you and your plumber. Okay, uh, and consider the dangers. Well, if you installed an improper PV on your roof, your roof might leak, but that should be between you and your contractor. Uh, the contractor should not install it if the roof is not strong enough to hold the weight. That's between you and your contractor. That's what we do in hot water heaters. The danger of hot water heaters, either tankless water heaters or, or the conventional ones, carbon monoxide poisoning, gas leak, explosion, fire, all these other things, okay? So, so there is a better way. Uh, and so when we began to realize this two years ago in the Department of Energy, we said, well, we've got to change what we're looking at Yes, we're gonna fund research in the technology, but we have to fund research in getting the soft costs down so that the installation costs come way down and make it easier. Uh, and so these are what we call soft costs. And the current director of SunShot is a fellow by the name of Min Lee. And he said, unlike physics, we can fundamentally figure out the upper limit for efficiency of solar cells. There is no such limit <laughs> of, to bureaucracy. And uh, yes, that is absolutely true. Uh, and so it's something you just have to fight back and fight back. You have to convince municipalities, don't view this as income enhancing for your city, the way parking tickets are income enhancing or speed traps. You know, just, just you know, <laughs> let this happen. Um, anyway, so let's project what I think the future might bring based on those learning curves, nothing deeper than that. Um, the cost of solar rooftop uh, could actually drop threefold to fourfold within the next 10, maybe 15 years. Okay, so what cost $20,000 a few years ago cost $15,000 today, but maybe it'll cost $10,000 tomorrow, okay? Um, now, consider what will happen. If um, our goal was $2 a watt installed on a residential home, a dollar a watt installed on utility scale, a dollar fifty watt for Costco warehouse type buildings, okay? But let's assume it's not uh, two dollars a watt, we failed and it's two fifty a watt. What Germany costs today, all right? Then if you have something like fourteen thousand dollars, you can go, if you live in Palo Alto, Menlo Park, you can go 80% off grid. 80% off grid means you also need energy storage. But energy storage, suppose we fail, and it's not $125 a kilowatt hour, but it's $200 including profit. Okay, just pretend. Uh, the whole system is $14,000. The payback period uh, is about four years, okay? But because you can shift from, from noon to four o'clock or from four o'clock to 12 o'clock at night with a, a four kilowatt hour battery, uh, that's pretty good. Now, it's even better than that because you're blackout immune. Not completely, you're blackout resistant. Okay, if there is a blackout, how much can four kilowatt hours get you? Well, your refrigerator takes 40 watts. All right, if you have three compact, 100, 100 watt equivalent, three compact fluorescent light bulbs you keep on for four or five hours a day, you have light, your food doesn't go bad, and you can last for about four or five days. So you, uh, and the payback period is uh, very short. So if this, now, it, it might not happen in 10 years, it might take 15 years. At the outside, it's gonna take 20 years at the longest. But sometime between 10 and 20 years, this will happen. When it happens, this could be a very disruptive technology. Think about what the internet did to publishing in the entertainment business. And so, what to do? 
Well, utility companies are waking up to this and they're getting very, very scared that they have a shrinking customer base. Um, because, you know, you just want the hookup for backup and reliability, but you actually need very little of them. All right, so I have a proposed solution. Why don't the utility companies partner with private sector companies? And they can use their ability to borrow money, so it could be very inexpensive. But they're part of the action, and they will own the equipment, the battery and the solar modules. They will maintain the equipment. They will install it. The customer doesn't have to worry about it. All they have to do is pay for electricity at the same cost or less, but they have blackout immunity. All right. Now, what a novel idea? Not really. This is the way the old phone system worked. They owned the phone. They repaired the phone. They installed the phone. You didn't buy a phone. You just bought phone service. What's in it for the homeowner? Well, cheaper rates, blackout immunity. What's in it for the distribution, the utility companies? They get indoor energy storage, away from the hot sun, away from the rain, away from all these things. A very benign thing you know, that's this big somewhere in your basement. And uh, they get the distributed network, which they would have to pay double that in order to make it weatherproof. And it, and it would be adopted sooner because you, you don't need as robust a battery because it's inside. And they can control the system. You know, they get to talk to it. So there's a lot in it for everybody. A lot of money may be made to everybody. Um, uh, we hope that uh, this is going on. Now, I'm out of time. I'm not going to talk about RPE, where you can have open constructive debates of uh, program manager to program manager, rather than this program manager is over here in batteries, and this program manager is over here in thermal stuff, and they don't talk to each other, or they don't influence each other, or they don't get into each other's business. I wanted something that everybody talked to one another. And, uh, and it depended on the quality of the people. And so in the Department of Energy, we recruited not only RPE, but other places, six members who are in the National Academies of Engineering and Sciences, but half of them were, got elected in their 40s, but were still in their 40s, OK? Now, I got elected in my 40s, but I was in my 60s, so I don't count. And so to get people at the prime of their career who are stellar people in industry and academia to come and work for the federal government for three years was different. And boy, did that change how we did things. And that was one of the things that I was most proud of. Um, one of the founding members of RPE is now an assistant. Oh, and then the, so we had a half a dozen, but we have certainly a dozen, which I'm confident will get into the National Academy of Engineering or Sciences as well. So that's an important thing. Um, now, these are very ambitious programs, EV Everywhere, Sunshot, RPE. But I reminded people, and as I reminded my students and postdocs, uh, and again, quote one of my favorite authors, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. That was Michelangelo. And uh, that is something very, very important that I tried to teach my postdocs and graduate students. Um, now, you know, would I become Secretary of Energy again? Uh, and go before oversight committees? Yes. Uh, not because I love oversight committees, but because uh, technical people uh, who can manage can really make a difference. And the most important thing I did is that I helped attract good people into the department. I would get on the phone and try to convince seven and eight levels down, program managers and sub-program managers, come join us. Okay, and then when, once they came and joined us and they were really moving in the right direction, I would tell the rest of the bureaucracy, the government, don't get in their way. <laughs> and, and so they would call me up or email me, you know, this has happened, that has happened. And so I was blocking and tackling, letting them carry the ball. And that is the most important thing. What would I have done differently? I probably would have followed my instincts more closely in the first year. It took me about a year or two to find that most of the politically savvy people were not so politically savvy. There are people who are definitely political savvy that I listen to. But, uh, you know, uh, I think following my instincts uh, earlier would have been better. Now, of course, you know, the, one of the things I really hate is the press. 
And sometimes you get unfairly attacked. Uh, for example, <laughs> six days after I announced I was not going to stay another term, um, this is on February 7th, um, the Onion reports hungover energy secretary wakes up next to solar panel. Now let me read you some of this scurrilous journalism. <laughs> Sources have reported that following a long night of crowding in a series of DC watering holes, energy secretary Stephen Chu awoke Thursday morning to find himself sleeping next to a giant solar panel he had met the previous evening. <laughs> now it goes on to say I couldn't even remember the manufacturer's name. <laughs> According to sources, Chu's encounter with the crystalline silicon solar receptor was his most regrettable dalliance since 2009 when an extended fling with a 90-foot wind turbine nearly ended his marriage. <laughs> so I walk, in, I walk into the apartment this, this morning when this story comes out. My public affairs person says, we got to answer this. We can't let this. So, so I said, OK, we've got to respond to this. So here's part of the response. I just want everyone to know that my decision not to serve a second term as secretary, energy secretary has absolutely nothing to do with the allegations made in this week's edition of The Onion. While I'm not going to confirm or deny the charges specifically, I will say that clean renewable solar power is a growing source of US jobs and is becoming more and more affordable. So it's no surprise that lots of Americans are falling in love with solar. <laughs> <clears throat> now, they would not let me put in, regardless of your sexual preference. <laughs> so there are limits. <laughs> but in any case, uh, let me finish by a few, not 80,000 foot level remarks, but a little bit higher than that. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. It was Earthrise from Apollo 8, taken Christmas Eve, 19. 68, the first mission to orbit the moon, and the last of the orbits, they turned the capsule earthward, and one of the astronauts took this picture. And uh, he said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we discovered the Earth. Now I want you to notice, this is pretty bleak place to live. From this distance, this is a pretty good place to live, but guess what, there's nowhere else to go. So hold that thought. <laughs> uh, I do think there are incredible business opportunities, economic opportunities for the United States to be a leader in this transition to sustainable energy. And just as we have to conquer the equivalent horse manure problem, in doing so, you become an industrial leader for the world. But also, there is a moral responsibility, because the most innocent victims, namely the poorest citizens of the world, or people yet to be born, had nothing to do with this. Uh, and there's an ancient American, ancient Native American saying says, we do not inherit the land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Now, with your indulgence, Jim, <laughs> he's looking very, he wants to talk to me, <laughs> but maybe not. Um, Voyager 1, if you've read today's paper, is finally exiting the solar system, not Pluto, but the solar system, including the solar wind and all this other stuff. It exited Pluto uh, in the 70s. So this is the orbit of Voyager 1, as it does the planet flybys. And uh, as it was exiting the orbit of Pluto, Carl Sagan convinced NASA to turn its camera Earthward. Now, its camera was designed to look at Uranus and Saturn and, and, and you know, the planets of, the moons of planets like those. Uh, for more close-ups. It wasn't designed to look at the Earth from the distance of Pluto, so it looks like a little pale dot. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, 
every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you.